Folks, good morning and welcome. My name is Peter Capelli. We're going to talk uh, this morning about jobs, talent management, learning, all that sort of stuff. Before we get going, though, this is a small and intimate group, uh, I think. Um, I don't know why it's so small and intimate. I'm not going to ask you for money or anything, so you can feel free to come in. Uh, let me take a minute and ask you to just say hello to the people sitting near you. So at the very least, you meet somebody before the session is over. Can we do this now for just a second? <laughs> Folks, if you're just coming in, we're just saying hello to each other for a second while we get settled. Good, we're off to a good start. Uh, so here's the theme. We're going to talk about talent management. We're going to talk about learning and education, but particularly we're going to talk about the link between jobs, what employers are doing on the hiring side, and what we might be doing on the education side. Right? And the organizers uh, suggested that maybe we start out talking about uh, some myths that we could debunk, but let me tell you a little about how I got interested in this topic. It was during the Great Recession. Do you remember these stories at the time about uh, employers who said they had nobody to hire? Do you remember that stuff? Uh, and that's how I got started in this, because it was pretty unbelievable, uh, these stories. And in fact, if you looked carefully at the stories, they never ask, first, who are you trying to hire? We always assumed that they were trying to hire school leavers, and that was almost never the case. They were trying to hire experienced people, right? And the second thing, they never asked them, what are you paying them? <laughs> what are you offering? What are you trying to do to find people? And they never asked that question either. Uh, but the assumption was that somehow there was just nobody out there who could be trained to do these jobs. And of course, that was not true at all. So let me talk about three myths here for just a second before we get underway. Uh, and I must say, when I talk about these things, I start to feel like Lewis Black. Do you know Lewis Black, the comedian? And how irritated he gets with uh, certain things. And you can think about all this as kind of something like alternative facts, right? And these are stories that were cooked up typically by consultants or people selling books. Uh, and then they get repeated and repeated and repeated, and people think that they're true. So let me tell you one of them. Uh, one of my favorites at the moment is that 40% of the U.S. workforce is contingent, and by 2025, it will be 50% or 90% or everybody in the intergalactic system will be contingent workers, something like that, right? Uh, the first thing to realize is we can't predict even one year out anything. And anybody who thinks they can tell you what the country is going to be like, the economy is going to be like, or the labor force five or 10 years out is nuts. Uh, the best data we've got on contingent work says at the moment the number is 15%. Uh, so what does that count? Temps, contractors, on-call workers, all that sort of stuff. And people who we think of as the gig economy. You know how many people are in the gig economy? You know what percentage of the workforce that seems to be? It's about 0.5% of people in the US labor force have had any contact of any kind with anything that looks like the gig economy. And that counts things like if you've ever signed up to work for Uber, and most people who signed up for work for Uber have never driven a car once, right? So that's a big myth. Uh, and here's my second one. Uh, and the second one is we really ought to be worried about robots are going to take over all our jobs, right? Uh, well, this is a story that has been around since the 1700s, actually, uh, where this story has been that technological change is going to be so great, it's going to eliminate all these jobs. We won't know what to do with ourselves. There won't be jobs for people. Uh, and now the one is about robotics, right? And particularly for some reason I don't understand, truck drivers seems to be the focus. Truck drivers are going to go away because robots will be driving trucks, right? Well, just do this mental exercise. Uh, the biggest trucking company in the U.S. is, I think, UPS, right? 
Can you imagine your UPS driver um, coming to your house and it's a robot, okay? What does a UPS driver do? They get the truck to your house, but what do they do after that? They unload the packages, they walk them down to your driveway, they talk to you about LeBron James, you talk about the weather a little bit, they get you to sign something. If you're not there, they figure out where to hide the packages so you, <laughs> you, know, you won't find them later. It's not the driving of the truck that's the thing, right? What truck drivers mainly do these days is they unload stuff, they load stuff, and if you think UPS is going to invest in a robot to drive a truck and then have some other guy just ride along with a robot to get out and deliver the packages, Okay, okay, people, okay, it's not that. It's long haul trucking, long haul trucking. That's what's really gonna go, okay. Uh, long haul trucking means like on some giant interstate, you know, the truck could go for 500 miles driven by a robot, but then it's gotta pull over, and what does a truck driver usually do besides go to the bathroom? <laughs> they put gas in it, they clean the windshield, all that kind of stuff. Somebody's gotta do that, right? And if we really wanted to eliminate labor when we hauled stuff, Right now, we've got the ability to haul hundreds and hundreds of cars or trucks full of stuff with almost no labor. It's called trains. We've had them for a very long time. And if the goal was just eliminating labor was going to make things so desirable, that's what would have happened. So here's the best statistic that argues for, or the best empirical story that's arguing that there's something up for robotics, and that's manufacturing. So here's the anecdote. And that is after the great, re since the Great Recession on, what we've noticed is the economy picked back up. Total revenue for manufacturing has expanded a lot, but employment has not moved very much. And so the assumption people are making is that that's because we've replaced people for robots, right? On the other hand, if you look at the data on productivity in the US, you see it's going nowhere. It's a big complaint. If you look at the information on innovation, interesting series of stories about this in the Wall Street Journal and The Economist, you see that their concern is innovation has actually been declining. That other than finding better ways to send photos to our friends, that's about all we've been doing in terms of innovation. Now if you drill down on the manufacturing data, here's what you find. What counts as manufacturing now is not the same as what it was a while ago. So if you're General Electric, for example, and you negotiate a service agreement, with some provider, or with some customer someplace, that still counts as manufacturing revenue. So what seems to have happened is, in the manufacturing sector, the idea of what is manufacturing is blurring. If I'm Caterpillar and I cut a deal with a Chinese company to design their bulldozers for them, that's revenue in, it's not really manufacturing, but it still counts as manufacturing. So the story there seems to be a big shift since the Great Recession, caused by the Great Recession, when a lot of traditional manufacturing got wiped out in the US, toward other things that are still under the heading of manufacturing, but they're not people assembling stuff anymore. And here's the last one on my, my list, and this is maybe my favorite, is millennials. Can we forget about millennials for just a little bit here? <laughs> and here's why. There's no evidence that millennials even exist. There's no demographer that has made any claim that there is such a thing called millennials, right? And if I explain it to you for just a second here, you'll get the reason why. Here's what demographers do. They draw distinctions between what are known as age effects, things that happen to people as they get older, and what are known as cohort effects. Cohort effect means there was something that happened to you and your classmates when you were at a formative age that was fundamental, and it wasn't the rise of the Apple a4 phone or whatever, right? It was like living through a war or living through a Great Depression. So for most people, age effects mean this. When you're 22, what are your big priorities that you could share with a room full of strangers? What were you focused on? Most people, social life was a big deal. As you get a little older, people settle down to relationship. Social life dwindles a bit in importance. Your priorities change. People buy houses, after that your priorities change because you need money and predictability and after that children arrive and then your life is over, right? What do you need when you get kids? Stability and money, right? It is not because you uh, are from a new cohort, it is because you got older. 
And to see the mistake here, I'm a baby boomer, some of us in the room are. When we were kids, when we were in our 20s, our parents said we were the laziest generation ever, that we were ungrateful, didn't want to pay our dues, and now they call us the workaholic generation. This is insane. We didn't change generations, we just got older, that's all. And so the thing about millennials is all they are is younger than the other people in your organization. If you wanted to see if they were different than younger people 10 years ago, here's what you'd do. You'd compare them and their, ad their attitudes and values to people who were 22 years old 10 years ago. And when you do that exercise, you know what they find? They're the same. You compare them to people who were 22 20 years ago, you know what you find? They're the same. And here's the other thing about it. Even if, on average, there was a difference between millennials and the people who were 22 10 years ago, so what? You're hiring 100 people out of a graduating cohort of 15 million. Just find the 100 people who suit you, right? So I think this is an enormous distraction. But we do have big challenges we ought to face up to, and here's the big challenge that we got to figure out how to resolve. Who's responsible for job skills in the US, right? Here's the standard model. Schools did educating, employers did training, colleges sometimes did occupational skills, but not always, right? Most of the kids in college campuses were not in engineering or accounting practices, programs, right? This is a generation or so ago. And then the companies would hire them, train them, develop them, promote them inside the organization. This is the way the world worked. This is kind of what's still in the back of our minds for lots of people, right? But what happens if employers want to hire people and don't want to train them, right? And that is kind of what is happening. So here's some data on this. If you look at apprenticeship programs, which everybody believes is the solution to a lot of our skill problems, they've been dropping like a stone. They've declined 50% just since 2003, right? And if you look at employer-provided training, this is the best data we got on this. Uh, if you look from about 2002 or 2001 to 2008, it dropped 20%. And it wasn't great to start with. So the data we've got on this, but I should say our training data is really lousy, from individual employees, says that if they got two hours of training per year, that would be a lot. And the data that we have say that most of the training comes from vendors who are providing you new equipment. Here's our new copier, here's how you use it, right? That has been the biggest source of training. So we're not training people, right? And it's gotten worse. So what is it we've got in the labor market? We've got kind of a plug and play model. The plug and play model means employers want to hire people who've already got the skills so they can step right in and fill the jobs. This is the most amazing statistic that I've seen, sums up a lot of stuff. If you went back before about 19, early 1980s, in a typical corporation, 10% of jobs were filled from the outside. We used to call those entry-level jobs. They were new college graduates, new high school graduates, and they would advance inside the company and be trained, right? So then 90% of the vacancies in the company would be filled by promotion or rotational assignments or movements within. In the U.S. at the moment, the figure is, depending on the year, it's no longer 10% filled from outside, it's 60 to 70% filled from outside, right? And if you keep that statistic in mind, you see that we've undergone an enormous sea change, okay? Why don't want employers want to train? Well, uh, here's my little model of this, um, and it shows you two things here in this model. There's uh, value or dollars or costs on the y-axis, there's time on the x-axis, right? And the curve line, which comes from real data, suggests the value a typical employee brings to an organization over their career, when they used to stay for an entire career. So you can see down here at the bottom, let's see if I've got my laser, I don't think I got my laser on this, but right at the bottom where it intersects the y-axis there, the curve line, when you first start working for an organization, what was your value? Almost zero. You were worthless. The idea of a steep learning curve comes from these data, and that is you get better really fast. Part of that is because employers might train you. Part of it is because your supervisor might take time to show you what you do. Part of it maybe is the employer just lets you muddle through. And then your performance would start to increase quite rapidly. And there was some evidence for production workers that by the end of your career it was tapering off a bit. 
But for our purposes, we can kind of forget the end of the career thing because almost nobody makes it to age 65 in a typical company anyway. Okay, what's the straight line? The straight line comes from employment compensation practices like the Hay Point system, if you're old enough to remember that, where the idea was we're trying to design an internal pay system so that as you're advancing in value, we pay you more over time. And you put these two lines together and you see what the issue is. The beginning of your career, you're costing us money, or we could say you're making an investment in you. Then shortly after that, even though your pay is going up, your value is going up so much faster that we're earning this big return from you, right? So investment, return on investment. This is the way the world used to work. What do you think happened to this model? You can just shout it out. It's a dark room. Nobody will know. What do you think? Well, there are two things. I know you were thinking the answer. <laughs> there are two things. One thing is people leave. When do they leave? Right at the point where you go from being a liability to the employer to being an asset. And the reason for that is the training investment is a sunk cost. And your competitors can pay your employees more than you can pay them at that point. Because you have to recoup that investment. They don't, because it's a sunk cost. So that's when people start to leave. Now the second part of the story, which doesn't get as much attention, is that in order to make this model work, we needed to be sure that that training investment could be used for quite a period of time. And that's not true any longer either because companies keep restructuring themselves all the time. It's not so much that job skills change as it is that companies restructure what they want. Okay? So this is the reason employers say they can't train is because we'll lose the investment if we train. People just poach our folks away and we can't be sure we need it. Right? So now we got a bit of a dilemma, right? Because everybody wants to hire somebody that somebody else has already trained and nobody wants to make the initial training investment. Colleges want to fill the gap in for-profit education providers, but now we got a supply chain problem. Here's the problem. Um, by the way, let me ask you, how many kids have, how many folks here have kids? Uh, how many kids have kids in college? How many of you have kids who are employed? What's it feel like? <laughs> I've got two kids who graduated who are not, not really employed, so I'd like to know what it feels like to have them off your leg, as we say, right? <laughs> Well, here's the supply chain problem. You got a 17-year-old kid who's thinking about college. They're not going to graduate from college if you're lucky for four years. And the typical student graduates only, you know, 40% of kids graduate in four years. Only 60% graduate in five years. So they're gonna, not going to be in the job market for five years. The employers on the other side are saying, here's what we need. Uh, but if you ask them, will you promise you hire me in five years? Of course not. They won't say that. And you got the colleges in the middle of this very long supply chain. And the colleges are saying often to kids, uh, we will provide you the information to get you a job. We'll be the broker in the middle, right? Now the question is whether they can really do that job or not. Because the employers don't really know what they're going to need in five years because we can't predict much of anything. But the kids are placing bets five years out trying to decide what it is they should be doing. And what we've had is a group of uh, colleges and for-profits, of course, who are always in this business, trying to provide job skills. So what is the shortage? It's not education. It's not knowledge in the general academic sense. It is work-based skills that are in short supply. What is it that employers want? We'll see later. They want people who have already done something like the jobs so that they can prove that you could step in and do them. Well, you can see all the reasons why classrooms are not a great way to learn most work-based skills. And we already were pretty much toward the job-based education model anyway. The biggest major in the US has been business for a long time, and second place is education, which is you know teacher education, right? Uh, but then we see majors and degrees like this. I'd love to be an adventure tourism major. That's got to be great. Uh, there's a lot of places that have turf management. What is turf management about, do you think? Golf course uh, maintenance and management. Casino construction management is a major in Philadelphia, Drexel. 
Pharmaceutical marking is not drug pushing, <laughs> but it is drug sales, right? It's legal drug sales, right? These very, very practical majors that we're seeing as a result. The problem is employers don't actually seem to want that, right? So this is data from a survey the Business Roundtable did a couple of years ago. I was part of the commission they were on. And the red bars are things the employers are complaining about. These are all you might call soft skills. The things down at the bottom that are in green, these are things, oh, we, they're actually more than we need. These are things like management skills, specialized knowledge. These are the kinds of things that you, know, you might think colleges, uh, colleges teach. right? So the things that they're complaining about are not the kind of things that you easily learn in classrooms anyway. It's taking a 22-year-old and making them act like, an 18, uh, like a 28-year-old. It's taking an 18-year-old and trying to get them to act like somebody who's older, right? Those are the things they're complaining about, but they've always complained about those things. And why? Because it's true. We would love to have younger people be more mature, but there's a reason they're not, and it has to do with biology, right? Okay. Uh, and here's this data. This is fabulous data from a survey done a couple years ago. Uh, from the Chronicle of Higher Education, surveying employers, asking them what are they looking for in people leaving college. Let me just, you don't have to read in, through the whole ones to get the punchline here. Uh, of those things they're looking for, the top five, only one of them has anything to do with your classroom experience. What are they after? Internships, work experience in college, right? Um, volunteer experience that kind of looks like work experience. Extracurricular activities that kind of look like work. That's kind of what they're after, right? So what should we be doing? I mean, what should we be doing as a society? Now we got the problem. The big problem is we're graduating kids who find it difficult still to get jobs. This might get better uh, as the labor market tightens by itself, but could we speed it along? We got employers who don't want to hire people without work-based skills, but they don't want to train them. We got colleges that are trying to provide work-based skills, or at least often claiming to provide them, but they're not really good at it. So what can we do about this, right? Well, let me just give you a hint here about what I think the problem is. And it goes back to my complaints about things I didn't like, myths, skill gap. Employees want to work differently. They want to be contingent workers. Robots are going to eat our lunch. Millennials are strange, right? You notice anything in common about those problems? None of them have anything to do with what employers are doing. They're all something outside. And the reason for that is the studies that are done are mainly paid for by employers, right? And so this is something we got to get our hands around. There's a lot of distracting stories, but the punchline of what's going on here has to do with the lack of work-based skills. So what can we do about this? We could try to shorten the supply chain. Let me say, if I um, forgot earlier, that I spent about at least 10 years in Washington. I ran a center with a colleague, Bob Zemsky, uh, called the National Center on the Educational Quality of the Workforce for the US Department of Education. Started in the Bush administration, continued all the way through the Clinton administration. We had exactly the same problems then, but we had also come up with solutions which almost everybody thought were good, and there was some evidence they were working, and then all the funding was pulled away from them. The idea of shortening the supply chain was what the school to work movement was about. You remember that one? That was trying to get employers and colleges and high schools closer together so that you, through internships or co-op programs or shadowing or something, people had a sense of what the workplace was like before they actually got into it. Maybe, as you see in other countries, we could take work experience into the classroom so you could see why this academic knowledge makes sense. Maybe we could apply some of the academic knowledge in work that you're at least observing in an organization outside. That would be great. Why is that not happening? That's something we'll come back to a little later. For the students, I think there's a big risk in trying to pursue one of these job-specific majors. And here's my favorite example of this. The hottest job in America through most of, the le of this decade, you know what job it was? It paid, at, some, at one point, 50% more than the next highest college major. You know what that job was? Not IT, petroleum engineers, right? 
And as soon as the petroleum engineering market started to boom, what happened to the enrollment in these petroleum engineering programs? They started growing by about 50% per year. And that new cohort of petroleum engineers comes into the market just when what starts to happen? Fracking, the glut of oil, collapse of oil exploration, and suddenly these folks are out of lunch. Now there's demand for engineers, but if you're a petroleum engineer, you cannot do computer engineering. It's a pretty specific major. And if you get these very specific majors like casino construction management and the casinos aren't hiring the year you graduate, what are you going to do? So is anybody thinking long term about this? The answer seems to be no, right? These are the things we love we could do more of, more internships, more apprenticeships, more co-op co programs. Why they're not happening is something we might talk about. Can we afford to train if you're employers? Yes, we can. Think about how we train doctors. You know how we train doctors? They finish medical school, but you don't want them touching you yet. First they go to be interns in hospitals, where they do the simplest tasks. And then after a year or so of that, they become residents in some specialty where they do more complicated tasks, and they monitor and direct the interns. And then they become house doctors, or then they become fellows, and they monitor and direct the residents. These are apprenticeship programs. If you think about accounting firms and consulting firms, what do they do? They hire smart college kids. They pay them 100 bucks an hour. Through work-based learning, they make them worth 200 bucks an hour. And the companies actually make money out of these folks. Consulting firms lose 95% of their kids in five years, and they still make money doing it. Turnover does not kill them. Those companies not only train people, they make money doing it. We can make money retraining as well. A great story from IBM that Diane Gerson, the head of HR, did there, where she went to the CFO and said, rather than lay off this group of IT people, which they were prepared to do because we didn't need their skills anymore, she said, let's find a way to co-invest with them. So he told them, look, we'll pay you for four days of work. On the fifth day, we'll provide you training if you want to take it. The training is on your own dime. Okay? We're not going to pay you for the training. But if you complete the training, we will re-employ you in another job someplace else. Would it be nicer if they paid them for all five days? Sure, if you're the employee. But they could at least make the case to the CFO about how this is going to work for us. Right? So this is the dilemma we've got. And the dilemma, I think, in short is we've got to get employers back into the game of training people some way or other, or this is just not going to be pretty. Okay? Let me pause here. I think we've got two more minutes for questions or thoughts if you folks have them. Or observations? Yes, sir. You can shout it out. I'll repeat the question. Uh, 40 years ago, for sure. Why do millennials switch jobs faster? Because somebody is hiring them away. Everyone who quits virtually, and the statistics on this, even if you count retirees, two-thirds of all the people who quit jobs immediately step into a job someplace else. So the idea that they're quitting to go home and pout and then go look for a job is not true. They're hired away by somebody else. So your retention problems are caused by somebody else's hiring solutions, right? Any other questions, things about uh, this you'd like to hear? Yes, sir. Teachers' salaries less competitive than other uh, options for Sure, right? Um, well, it's an interesting question about quality of teachers. One of the things we've learned, shock, um, after all this research on schools, teacher quality matters. But figuring out what makes for a good teacher is not so clear, right? And dumping a bunch of Ivy League kids into public schools for three years does not seem to be the answer for sure. It takes a while to learn how to teach, and just rotating smarties in there doesn't seem to help very much, right? Yes, ma'am. Um, so you mentioned that colleges might not be the best broker in this yeah. scenario. So yeah. can you talk a little bit more about the opportunity for others to be brokers between colleges um, and employers and what that might look like? Well, uh, you could certainly broker, but uh, this means finding employers who are interested in co-op programs or things like that, or finding ways to hire interns and stuff like that. The brokering, per se, uh, would be nice, 
but you know, my colleagues at Drexel, who have the most famous co-op program in the US, they report that they spend millions of dollars each year chasing employers to participate in these programs. Because the problem is the employers want to come in the year they want to hire. They don't want to come in two or three years before and start developing those kids so that they can hire them at the end of the third year, right? So the problem, again, is how do you get the employers engaged in this process? Some of it is about social awareness, I think. So in the 1990s, we did a survey with the Bureau of the Census at the end of the School to Work Opportunities Act, if you remember that one. And at that point, a remarkable large number of employers said they had some kind of arrangement with their local high schools. That's when the labor market was really tight. That employer was below 4%. And if you ask them why they did it, the most common response was social responsibility. Now, once they did it, they found out that it actually paid off for them to do it in all kinds of good ways. But they did it initially because they thought it was the right thing to do. And I don't know why we don't pursue more of that. Right? And one more, and then I think it's lunchtime. I'm standing between you and a pastrami sandwich here. Yep. I think you mentioned it when you were be beginning, but I think you've said a number of times that employers just don't pay enough to attract people into these fields where they can't find uh, the number of people that they need. So why don't they just pay more to attract more people? Well, there are three issues, right? Uh, and if you look at these complaints, which go back at least to World War II, and you look at the government, every time the government commissions a study to see what's going on, employers complain there's a shortage of machinists. Since the 1940s, they've been making that complaint. And every time the studies say the same thing. They say, what employers need to do is train more people, right? or spend more time recruiting, or pay more, or some combination of those three. Now, why don't employers pay more? Some of it, I think, uh, is a CFO-related problem. And that is, uh, in many organizations, the CFOs dominate all the discussions. And their goal is to minimize costs at all consequences. And I don't think we've done a good enough exercise persuading the CFOs that not filling positions is expensive. So in lots of places, they actually think they're saving money when they lay positions vacant, because it looks like their budget uh, improves, but you're losing opportunities along the way. Right? There are calculators you can download that will show you how much you're losing. Um, so it's pretty easy to calculate this stuff, but we haven't done it. We haven't made the case to the CFOs that it's important to reduce turnover and it's important to fill vacancies fast. So I think that's something that falls a little back uh, onto us to do. Right? But there's also no doubt that companies are under a lot of financial pressure to keep costs down. That's for sure. But on the other hand, the only reason that standards of living rise is if there's enough wage pressure to push wages higher. So somehow in the national discourse, we've seemed to come to the conclusion that rising wages are a bad thing for the economy. And if you think that, boy, you gotta, it's, it's going to be hard to explain that to most of the people in the US who work for pay, right? Because that means ah, you guys have to take a pay cut to help the economy. Uh, I don't think that's going to go over very well. And you know what? I've never heard that argument go all the way up to the executive suite. I never heard people in the executive suite say, we need to make less money so our business will be competitive. Right? On that happy note, I think I should get out of the way and let us all go to lunch. Thank you very much for being with us. Good luck with the rest of your show here.